Welcome to Echoes of Swing. My name is April DeShields and we're sitting today with Ed, Mr. Eddie Metz Jr. I can never say that name without just wanting to say Metz. Uh, so sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, but, you know, my dad passed away 12 years ago. And so the, I've been slowly trying to uh, edge the junior away. Edge, so yes. Eddie Metz is okay. That's fine. It, you know, I have to uh, let people know Eddie Metz Jr. Ed Metz Jr., Eddie Metz, or Ed Metz are all okay. Acceptable, okay. Yeah, and on, when you're on YouTube, folks, put all those names in. I will make <laughs> sure and tag you as such. <laughs> yeah, right, all the different titles. I just remember when Monterey, when I had your, your dad's band out and Tim came out, I hollered at you from across a hallway or something, hey, Metz, and three faces turned and went, <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is going to be a long weekend. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've moved to New Jersey. Guys in New Jersey tend to call other guys by their last name. Uh -huh. or, so the, they, all of us were Metsy when we moved to New Jersey. <laughs> Metsy. You know. So, but it usually was a big Eddie and little Eddie. Oh, I'm sure. Pushed at home when, we were, when I was growing up. Yeah. Phone for and Big Ed. And then you yeah. became six foot tall and it was no longer big and little. <laughs> no, it was even, even, you know, till the day he died, it was always, it was always big Ed and little Ed for my relatives. Yeah. Cause you worked for them up at the oh. Sacramento Jack Trad camp for a long time. And that was a long time ago. Yeah. yeah thanks for that reminder. <laughs> <laughs> I taught at that camp about 25 years. Really? Was it that long? Yeah. Jeez. I uh, I had given them my notice for last year, 2019, that I wasn't going to do it anymore. Oh, and yeah. It was up to here. Yeah. Just well, how did, how did you end up getting in that? Believe me, it had nothing to do with, first of all, the faculty. No. Which I love, like yeah. my brother and sisters, Bill yeah. and Shelly, Anita. And Eddie had gone already, but the days of Eddie and Westy being there were just outrageous. You remember them. And it was mm -hmm. just fun. Trust me. Rusty wasn't into it really anymore. Yeah. Jason's life, um, you yeah. know, still yeah. just doesn't ever want it to end. And I yeah. totally, right. totally. The faculty, I love them. The camp is beautiful. You know mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Accommodations after we moved down to add better than they were up at the cabins because we had a refrigerator and a microwave. Yeah. Right. But. It had, and nothing, absolutely nothing to do with the kids or the yeah. Sacramento Foundation. I just couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. No, I, I don't could. blame you. It's not easy up there. I just couldn't. It was rewarding, mm -hmm. and fulfilling, and I learned a lot mm -hmm. from the kids and about kids. It yeah. helped me with my own kids. And uh, so it wasn't just a music camp for me, and it was yeah. a big part summer every year for two weeks to go up there yeah well it was for me too as much time as I could take while I could take it as you know until my health went screwy but yeah and uh yeah. I remember sitting and doing a overnight gym watch duty you and I late one night and I, <laughs> I, you hadn't married Joyce yet and you were going on about Joyce and I was just so happy I, I was like crying because <laughs> you were just so content talking about Joyce and I'm like I'm so happy for you because well, I've never seen you this happy but that probably was around we started going out I think 98 was it yeah so, might have been a couple of years after that when I could have been realized. somewhere yeah I just remember we, you and I got got uh, stuck with gym duty that night <laughs> Never had to do that. After we went down to admin and Patty Wassum took over as the counselor and they started yeah. hiring old, uh, not old, but people who yes. had been for as campers right. as kids and they knew all the secrets and all the ins mm -hmm. and outs of mm -hmm. yours, yes. all the non yours. That stopped. That stopped. Yep. Never had to do that. I think Keith Penny used to sleep in his hammock out in the in the quad. <laughs> You like doing that i'm sure <laughs> but uh, after a while all of that bad not that there was a lot of bad behavior but no but just kids, kids get stuff the roof anymore <laughs> yeah man i just if that i think it was if it wasn't you and me it was you and or me and westy or somebody with cat kids like daring each other because you know how that back 
right part of that gym sure. where that that exactly. roof comes down Thanks we're daring e- yeah daring each other jumping off of it and one kid hurt his leg or i don't know somebody was always hurting themselves some way or another but uh, that's that stopped yeah. and got pretty serious about it and uh bill dendel was great he put a great program together oh yeah we had 10 bands 100 kids and then we had oh we had about 70 adults for about five years oh yeah that that was fun doing adult camp yeah you know (laughs) i just remember us hanging out late with abe and westy and those that was always just so much fun it was just like a a hang that didn't end for a week (laughs) was well, I was going to ask you, how did you end up getting that job with the SAC Trad Camp? Because I know that was just such a huge, I know so many kids that appreciated you as their instructors, especially for so long. I got that job, you know, I was with that band, probably hardly anybody remembers anymore, the Black Dogs. No, I remember, <laughs> but yeah. Well, when I was, when I was, when the Black Dogs were together, they were, everybody came to see us, musicians, yeah. and festival directors from all over the place, and so all of us in the band got to know people. And I remembered Kurt Pearsall from when I first moved to Orlando. I think he was still here. Yeah. Working at Rosie O'Grady's for Bill Allred and doing that. And then he left and went to Sacramento. Then the Black Dogs show up out there and I run into Kurt again. And I said, hey, I don't, are you running the band camp out here now? He goes, yeah. I said, man, I'd love to do that. I just kind of mentioned it in passing. Yeah. And I might have mentioned it to a couple of other people like Mike Foley or yeah. Roger Crum yeah. or um, uh, Hal Needham. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Bev, cool. even. Yeah. Uh, Mike's still alive. Everybody else is about gone. Yeah. And, I think Bev is. Um, too, when your shirt called me up and said, hey, you want to try and do band camp next year? I said, yeah, sure. Of course. So I did. That started it. I think that was. 1994 or five oh, yeah okay. right around there yeah I remember you yeah. mentioning it one year at sacramento but it was one of those things where it just kind of went in one ear out the other so right or maybe it was because of you that i ended up offering to help i can't remember and- i don't know but when i went there there was i think there was 16 or 20 faculty members two on each instrument yeah and had two instructors for each band Mm-hmm. so my first year i was with start i got put, partnered with jerry lopes mm-hmm. who's sacramento he conducts i don't know if he still does the sacramento pops mm-hmm. summer he's a bass player so we got in this band together i had never done camp before and uh he said we got into the room and we introduced ourselves to the kids and i started writing stuff down i was expecting him to kind of step forward and because he'd done it before. Yeah. Can't show what was going to go on. He goes, I got to go to the bathroom. I'll be right back. And he left the room and he never came back. <laughs> that was back in the days we had to write charts for our yeah. kids. We had to write charts. After a while, when Bill took it over, Bill Dundell took it over, we just handed out lead sheets. Yeah, and I remember became, that part. Yeah. Learn to improvise camp. Yeah. which is what the music that we play is all about. Right. Well, and you that's know, what you, the kids were constantly trying to force you guys to help them with anyway. Right. So then we started improvisation classes and theory classes and things like that for an hour a day. Yeah. When we had improvisation class or theory class, I got the drummers mm-hmm. for an hour. I get to do drum clinic for an hour with the drummers, which I think they really got a lot out of. I do too. <laughs> I remember I uh I don't know I was helping Evil Bill with schlepping cords around or something you know getting (laughs) probably and uh I had a break and I think you got you had all the drummers outside the cafeteria yeah site number nine Uh uh-huh and um I had a few minutes I was just hanging out so I'm like oh let's listen to what Metz has got to say because all the kids were kind of like you know I said well I gotta hear this so I walk over and I swear I almost just dropped dead of a heart attack because you were saying exactly what Saunders had said to me when I was like six about the different parts of the beat. Yeah. Oh, you and think I of just it. was like, 
I'm hearing a, a, a recording loop here. <laughs> and yeah, so no, that was kind of my thing. I'd explain to the kids, if you can visualize the note of mm -hmm. one quarter note, maybe being a foot long. I usually use a yard because then I can hold my arms out wide. Yeah. And it's easy to divide it in the middle. And there's guys who play right in the middle of the beat. Mm -hmm. And there's guys who play in front of the beat. And there's guys who play in back of the beat. And as a drummer, I have to figure out how to play with people like that. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, I'm going to be in the middle of the beat. But yeah. what happens if somebody's kind of behind the beat? Do I push it a little bit? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. And it becomes very minute. And it's easy to talk about it and hard to explain. Yeah, exactly. It's like if you get it, it's easy to talk about. But if somebody right. isn't understanding, you can't explain sure. it. Right. But I just I remember that because that was one of the things that once I was playing myself in high school, my music teacher was attempting to explain what you were telling these kids. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, duh. <laughs> and all the kids of, got this. Kind of we, <laughs> yeah, just kind of how we think, especially being a drummer. Yeah. Boy, oh boy. No. Well, you've got to know what that is. I also used to say to them, listen, Drumming is drumming is drumming, no matter what style of music you're playing. Right. The actual physical motion of playing the drums, learning how to bounce the stick, which is the whole secret to it. Mm -hmm. And listening, listening and getting a good sound is true in any style of drumming. Right. Okay. And so you have jazz, which is based in triplets and swing eighth notes, and then you have rock and other music that is based in straight eighth notes. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes rock has a swing to it. Sometimes polkas swing, mm -hmm. you know. It's true. And go listen to Jimmy Stir. They swing the hell out of it. Yeah. So it's all, I used to just tell the kids, you know, I can't improve your your technique in a week. At right. camp. I can give you tools to go help your technique. Right. But I want to introduce you to how to deal with different styles. And yeah, so you're was, not going to walk out of here playing like Buddy Rich. It's not going to happen, right. but... Or walk out of there playing like Neil Peart from Rush. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the kids at that time really liked him. They'd come in. Who's your favorite drummer? Chad Smith from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Yeah. None of them hardly ever said a jazz drummer. No, because that they didn't. Yeah. They didn't know about them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Used to say, Listen, "I'm going to talk about some old guys." Yeah. That that you've never heard their names before. But if you do me a favor and just write it down on the piece of paper I handed you yeah. and go to YouTube, which is your greatest tool ever. Yeah. Or go to go to drum workshop and watch all the different solos of different drummers and see all their techniques. Best way to learn how to play drums is to watch other guys. Do yep. It. yep. Well, and one thing Hedges used to do was every year he and Saunders would literally write a list out of different musicians even i mean you know hedges being hedges he would throw in things like read voltaire you know just like what oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know how hedges would be yeah I but know. they would come up with a list and that was basically my homework every year and so my yeah. mom would take me to the library and i would get as much as i could find and sure. yeah but one thing i do remember is i it was i don't know if we were hanging out in somebody's room or uh, what at some festival and you started uh, some I may have been Alan he had his computer with the speakers so it was probably his room and we were always listening to music and it you know sometimes having conversations in between and you started getting kind of like looking at me like and, and giving me I started getting the feeling like okay is something gonna happen that I need to leave because I don't, I don't you, you you got this weird look on your face and you brought out a, a, a disc of uh, some rock band, I don't remember which one. And you were like, don't tell Saunders I played this for you. Yeah, he's gonna kill me. And I went, uh -huh. so I pulled out like it was a Santana or a CCR or something like that. And I'm like, well, then you can't tell him I've got this. <laughs> and oh, you're, yeah, like, right. you're like, oh, he'll be, he'll be more mad at you than me. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Good on my on my trips i'd sit for hours on planes you know yeah so we've done it before i have tunes on my phone and mm -hmm. my headphones and i just set it on shuffle and it's a pretty wide variety of things yeah. that are gonna oh yeah me too never, never my own recordings though 
Yeah, well, I, can't I mean, you've heard, you had to hear those over and over and over again when you were producing them. Yeah, I always do. And in fact, there's one that I just heard recently that's going to come out by uh, a guy in Windsor, Hugh Leal. Uh -huh. a there. I knew him from when I lived in Michigan, Saunders. Everybody knew him, Paul Keller. Um, he's putting out a recording of the Easy Street Jazz Band, which I was the original drummer in in Ann Arbor, uh -huh. playing a show, playing a concert with Pee Wee Irwin, uh -huh. corn player. Yeah. And so he sent the tracks just for me to listen to it. And I was like, oh my God, I was 20 years old. You know, I was in college yeah. And, yeah. and a tumultuous point in my life where I was trying to be a musician and my parents didn't want to hear that. And yeah. Yeah. Flunked out of school. But that's another story. Actually, I tell that story on Dan Zeilinger's. Yeah. Interview. Yeah. So I'll do that here. But yeah, um, he played the, and I listened to it. And I'd get about halfway through it and I'd be like, oh, man, I'd go, go to the end where maybe there was a drum solo <laughs> or, or bar break at the end. And I'd be like. Oh, okay. And I wrote back to Hugh, okay, this will be fine, but I'll probably never listen to this again. Yeah, exactly. Can't, <laughs> because, I can't deal with it. Yeah, it's like, why did I do that? But mm -hmm. that's the recording, you know. Well, it's part of growing up and just kind of, you know, yeah. finding but your I own way. Before, I said it before, I, I know it. Mm -hmm. And I know it wasn't my best performance. Of course, I was yeah. 20 years, but I'm just not i'm gonna say okay thank you you know and yeah kind of way this is gone forever <laughs> it's well not really but yeah no i <laughs> usually know gone forever so it's okay that's well speaking of saunders and being 20 years old that he used to say that and for anybody because again interviewing friends for me is difficult because i automatically yeah. you and i know who we're talking about but anybody yeah. watching wouldn't tom saunders not the bass player from new orleans but Cornet his player, uncle. yeah, his uncle in uh, Detroit was like another dad to me. But you, he had, uh, he said, or he had told me, and this may be wrong, or him trying to pull my legs. A lot of times, I don't, never could tell when he was doing that. That he had hired you as a teenager with like McKinney's cotton pickers, or was oh, um, when I was, my dad was a piano player. Yeah. We lived in Ann Arbor, but he wasn't a professional piano player, but he was a very good player. Yeah, he was. Um, when a guy named Dave Hudson put together the revival of the McKinney's Cotton Pickers called the New McKinney's Cotton Pickers, which was a regional hot 20s big band. Yeah. Um, in the Detroit area, in the Detroit, Ohio, Indiana area. Um they put together the revival band playing all those old arrangements, which Dave Hudson had transcribed. Tom Saunders was the second trumpet player. They asked my dad to be the piano player when Got they it. first okay. put it together. Yeah. So my dad went to the first rehearsal, found out that they had a whole bunch of jobs lined up. It was going to interfere with his day job, and he had to pass on playing with the band full time. But then Dave Hudson called him and said, Do you have a teenage son who's a kind of a kind of a big guy he likes to move equipment <laughs> <laughs> yeah my son eddie he's a drummer he's moving his drums around all the time he said would he be interested in being the band boy for this band uh-huh which meant going to all their gigs right being there early to set up the sound and set up the stands and set up the lights and put the music out and make sure the chairs were there yeah maybe help the drummer move his stuff in so i got hired as the band boy for the oh, mckinney's okay. so i got to sit there all night long and listen to these guys play. Yeah. So it was Saunders, and then the just recently passed John Trudell was playing lead trumpet. Yeah. A really good friend of mine from Ann Arbor, Paul Klinger, played third trumpet. Yeah. Uh, the saxophones were amazing. Dave Hudson was on alto. Teddy Buckner was from the Jimmy Lunsford band. Yeah. He was playing alto. The huh. tenor player was George Benson, who was the Detroit saxophone player who played a lot of Motown stuff. Yeah. Along with the baritone player, Ernie Rogers. Oh, I haven't seen. Yeah, okay. So I think most of these guys have now passed on. Yeah. And Paul and Johnny and Tommy have. Al Winters was the trombone player. He, he's passed also. Oh, the I drum, love that. The guy. So I used to sit and watch the drummer, Mel Fudge. And that was how I learned how to play 1920s style drums with press rolls and choke cymbals and things like that. But they also played more regular swing jazz like Condon style 
Right. They call it called Dixieland tune in the middle of a set and have a Dixieland band pop up out of the band. Yeah. So I got to sit and watch that. And then when Mel passed away, they had, uh, Paul Klinger was leading the band at the time and he asked me to be the drummer. So. Oh, neat. Cause you already knew all the tracks <laughs> already. Yeah. I think at the time I was in uh, my first gig with them, I think was still in high school. Oh yeah. Like a junior. I remember Saunders saying you were in high school or something, but I couldn't yeah. remember all the details. We went in an RV and drove to Charleston, West Virginia. And oh, geez. There's a picture of me, so I'd have to find it. Me in the, in the in a big, huge, gigantic, the only jacket they could find, a white jacket <laughs> with piping around it with a black ruffled shirt and a white bow tie. I, I have a picture of the guys in the band, you know, who sent it to me was Saunders' nephew. Because uh, I was trying to come up with a bunch of pictures uh, for an archive show I did years ago and I was 20 myself and I was trying to figure out how to put these pictures because it was an audio only how I was going to arrange this and so I asked Tom for some help and he sent me a bunch I'll have to send you some but that they're the ruffled 70s shirts yeah yeah black it was a black shirt with white edging yeah and then it was a white <laughs> jacket with black piping and a white bow tie. Oh my God. It was God. pretty sharp. Yeah, it was like backwards of everything. Like it's usually a black jacket and a white shirt. Right. It was a white jacket, and black my shirt. My dad got married in a tux like that with a white jacket. So, <laughs> yeah. It's all right. I've but then again, your... my mother wore a hoop skirt. So we'll move right on. <laughs> <laughs> I think your problem, I looked great in a lime green tuxedo. God. Oh, yeah. Reminds me of that scene in Dumb and Dumber, but yeah, that was light blue and orange. <laughs> pretty much kind of like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that that reminds me. I now remember why I started saying "Hey Mets." It was because uh, you were imitating Curly one time to make me oh. start laughing. Uh, Curly, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and ah, so and ah. it just because Curly would go, "Hey guys, hey fellas," or something like that. So that's what hey, that, that's what it was. Yeah. Hey Mets. <laughs> a lot of history my girl huh a lot of history there i know you didn't know you were going to get a kid sister when sonder hi hired you for the midwest all-stars did you <laughs> no Thank you.